What's good, friends? List episode 88 of the Game Pass Gamecast coming at you. Elden Ring continues to be one of the industry's most anticipated titles, after the tremendous critical acclaim that From Software titles have received over the years. At the same time, almost nothing is officially known about it, aside from George R. R. Martin's involvement via a CG trailer in 2019. That is, until now. So, this week, we examine the recent footage and information leaking about From Software's next epic, and just what to make of the next step in the Soulsborne genre. Do the new forms of exploration advance the sometimes stoic presentation? Is the talk of internal delays a blessing in disguise in a new COVID world? And could we expect this at Microsoft's rumored upcoming event? Plus, Epic Games is planning to acquire Mediatonic, the studio behind the smash hit Fall Guys. Outside of financial stability, are there any other unforeseen benefits coming to the UK-based studio now being under the Epic umbrella? And are there any potential pullbacks? Also, a new Aliens title is coming this summer. The next Need for Speed takes a backseat at EA and much, much more coming up on the newest jam-packed episode of the Game Pass Gamecast. <laughs> now the fun begins. Bridget. Stop! You violated the law. Welcome back to another episode of the Game Pass Game Cash, your weekly go-to podcast for all things Xbox, Xbox Game Pass, and PC gaming, including news, rumors, and conversation around them damn good video games. You can catch new episodes of the show when they drop each and every Friday morning on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and all other major podcast services. So be sure to subscribe to us, rate us, review us, all that jazz I tell you to every week at the beginning of the show, all the whole, the whole rigmarole wherever you get a podcast at, and follow us on Twitter at GPGC Podcast. Stay up to date with everything regarding the show, video games alike, and our dope giveaways. I'm your host, as always, Travis White, a.k.a. Travelist on most internet platforms. Joining me, as always, my partner in crime, the birthday boy. Still the birthday boy a little bit. We, we got, what, an hour? We're recording really late uh, this week, but... We got we 55 got, minutes. We got birthday. 55 minutes left in your birthday. The birthday boy, my boy, Mike p -Pack. Mike. What's good? What's going on? And, and I think more important than your birthday, there's another anniversary that is celebrated today. The Elder Scrolls Oblivion is 15 years old today on the day of recording. So what I want you to do is, well, first, obviously, happy birthday. Um, even though I told you that, <laughs> yes, I, I got to see you yesterday, so which was dope. So I got to tell you that yesterday. But give me, to kick off the show, because I, I want good vibes to kick off the show, give me... Your favorite Oblivion memory to celebrate 15 years of one of the best RPGs, in my opinion, of all time. Okay, 15 year anniversary of Oblivion. One of my first or one of my best memories of the game, mm -hmm. I would say. There's just a, there's a lot to kind of sift through in my brain, but I would say. You know, like the. I guess the Dark Brotherhood comes to mind when you kind of cleanse the the Chaden Hall, uh, the Chaden Hall <laughs> uh, hall there. I don't know what else to call it. The Chaden mm -hmm. Hall chapter of it. That mm -hmm. one's pretty good. But I would have to say probably the first thing that really comes to mind when I think about just memorable Oblivion things. Mm -hmm. This, this one's actually tough. I feel like uh, I feel like I, I'm trying to really dig deep there to to kind of do it justice for the 15 year anniversary. But I would say like moreover than just like the first time us walking out of the gate of the sewers and, and uh -huh. seeing the world that we were about to delve into, like that's obviously top tier. Uh -huh. But I would say my favorite obl Oblivion memory would be the Shivering Isles expansion and going through Mankar Cameron's Paradise. That's probably my number one favorite thing if there's one thing i could do and I, I do forget a lot of it so that's something i could probably actually do is do a playthrough of oblivion very mm -hmm. soon but the first time playing through main car cameron's paradise and that entire storyline with the shivering isles mm -hmm. is just next level it was probably 
I mean, pretty close to my favorite expansion ever. I would say Diablo 2 Lord of Destruction edges it out barely. Mm -hmm. But that expansion with the Shivering Isles and everything is just next level. I don't know. I, you know, I, I, I try to think of how, you know, I try to think of like different expansions on RPG games and that one's just next level. Mm -hmm. It's like right along uh, Lord of Destruction for me, for sure. No, definitely. Um, and, and I'm in the same boat as you, like you know, one of the first things that comes to mind is walking out of the Imperial sewers for the first time and just you and and that being such a graphical showpiece at the time. And, you know, a lot of like because it was launch window, it wasn't a launch game, but it was launch window for the 360. And, you know, it launched on PC first. But uh, I think a lot of a lot of fans first experiences with this game in terms of mainstream popularity was on the 360, obviously. Um, but you know, coming out of the Imperial sewers for the first time and really seeing just how drastic there was an improvement and not only obviously, you know, texture quality and whatnot, but depth of field, uh, view distance, um, color palettes, being able to actually, you know, render out colors in I'm sure the millions at that point, um, you know, it in the lighting, you know, actually having like, you know, getting to that point where it is actually somewhat like, you know, and sure, you look back on it now and some of the areas are like, man, that's really glossy. Like lighting doesn't necessarily do that all the time. Like, but at that point, like it was really pushing what, you know, console console level, you know, hardware can do at the time and really being that graphical showpiece. And I mean, I still and one of the other things that really kind of stands out to me is the first time you're going going to Kavach and you're going to, you know, the first Oblivion gate that you find, but you just look up at the sky and seeing that skybox that they had being so detailed and you could see certain constellations and things like that that, like, just stick out that it's, like, it just boggles my mind that this game's still 15 years old and, like, I still find ways that I'm, like, that looks... Some of the areas of this game, and I know people kind of give it shit every now and then, and in, in, in some degrees, rightfully so, because there are a lot of people who, you know, I think it's the perfect blend of both traditional Elder Scrolls experiences and, you know, what we're seeing now with a lot of modern RPGs uh, in some of the streamlined areas. But, you know, to me, it's the perfect meaning of all that. And I can understand the criticisms and why people say, oh, it's kind of the black sheep of the Elder Scrolls series. But to me with that game it's the perfect melting pot of everything in terms of what an rpg can do at least a western rpg um but i digress i mean at the end of the day it's one of our favorite games of all time we fucking talk about it 24 7 it's it shocker uh, if you're playing bingo for the show this week of course you got to have us mentioning oblivion at some point it always comes up <laughs> but, um, i i don't i don't get the black sheep thing i don't neither get do hate. i um but at the same like i shouldn't say i don't get it i i do because whenever you like whenever you hold it up to like i think it stands as a game itself i personally think it stands much higher than skyrim but if you're looking at it as you know where it stands in the lineage of modern elder scrolls games i'm talking modern i guess from morrowind on Morrowind is being remembered as, hey, that's the first time they did it on console and it ran well and it got a lot of people into traditional RPG experiences and being that kind of, you know, that first high that you get. But, you know, I understand the people who are also like, well, it's a black sheet because if you look at sales numbers, you know, compared to Skyrim, it's on the same, it released on the same console as Skyrim, yada, yada. It had whatever it was at that point five years of time to you know knock up sales numbers and whatnot before skyrim came out and this and that which you know i think is kind of a weird argument to a degree because that really shouldn't do anything but some people you know try to justify it that way but i i'm kind of with you i i more so don't get it than do but i do see where people like can have the argument but i don't agree with the argument you know what i mean it's like there's so much in Oblivion that's there as far as an RPG game. Like, I can understand some people might think it's a little goofy looking sometimes. It, it can be a little buggy, but, like, you can pretty much play that game from start to finish, complete every single guild and every single quest with a character 
and it, there's going to be hundreds of hours of gameplay and you know 30 40 levels of character building there mm-hmm. i just don't i i don't get it as much I, I see a game like it i see like fallout new vegas as like the best in the series for those respectable for those games in respect but again i i like those heart a little bit of more hardcore experience and i feel like the Skyrim getting the popularity is a kind of a testament to people wanting games more streamlined and spoon fed to them than anything else. But that's not a bad thing that people want that type of experience. It's just not what I'm looking for personally. So I think that's where like the disconnect can be is like certain people want things spoon fed. They want a linear gameplay where, you know, the main quest line on oblivion, you can kind of neglect it the entire game. If you want do everything else, like mm-hmm. it's not forced on you to do it, or you could do the entire main quest line and then go do the other stuff or you could do like like we used to do and and me and adam and and me especially is like i'll go do some main quest stuff and then after i do main quest stuff i'll go do the arena for a little bit then when i get bored of that i'll go do the fighters guild when i get bored of that i'll go do the thieves guild when Mm -hmm. i get bored of that i'll go do the mages guild if i get bored of that i'll go like i I always used it as a way to like well i'm kind of getting bored of this i'm just going to move on to the next thing i can do and go as far as i can with that and it was just a way that it always stayed fresh for me i thought Mm -hmm. No, definitely. And it always felt like I feel like diving into Skyrim like and not that not that it needs to be like not that it's a quicker pace, but I feel like Skyrim can drag at some points narratively and from an immersion standpoint where it's like it becomes a little too. What's the word I'm looking for? Like you feel kind of. I feel it it feels very linear at some points, like Skyrim comparatively. And I think that's, you know, on purpose, obviously, it was to get more people into the series and whatnot. But, um, you know, at the same time, though, I feel like that bogged down the game to a degree where it wasn't as, you know, when you're playing, if you're if you're familiar with RPG experiences, you know that there's some ways that you can cheese certain things. There's some ways that you can, you know, power level. There's some ways that you can, you know, focus in on, you're wanting to focus in on specific stats and things like that. And to be able to do that in Skyrim is almost impossible for the most part um, because they streamline so much of it. And I feel like that kind of then in turn, you feel that kind of switch away to, or you feel that kind of bleed over into everything it does from a narrative perspective where, everything is so streamlined and linear that when you're usually playing an RPG experience, it's about the breadth of the situation or of the, uh, the breadth of the actual game. And, you know, usually it's, you know, most RPGs now that are even traditional RPGs are open world to a degree or much larger scale. And it's meant to get immersed and lost in that world where, you know, if it's, you know, if I want to play Uncharted, which I fucking love Uncharted, I have an Uncharted tattoo that like that experience is very linear. And it's like I'm expecting it to, you know, tell me a specific story where the emphasis on Elder Scrolls before was very much you're you are to be your own character. And I think what was really good about Oblivion especially was you weren't you weren't necessarily the hero. You weren't necessarily the main focus you were secondary where mm-hmm. in Skyrim you're fit into one specific role. You were the dragonborn and that's it where in oblivion and even more went to a degree, but much more in oblivion. It took the pressure off the player of needing to fill that role where you could technically be a shithole. You could be a, a bad person, still complete the quest line, but not have to worry about anything else. Like you, it, it gave you much more freedom and, to me, that always will stand out in reasons why I tend to always just go back to fucking Oblivion over and over compared to Skyrim. But I digress. We're getting long in the truth on just the intro. But uh, but to be fair, uh, pretty slow new- news week in terms of Xbox stuff. But uh, just wanted to touch on, obviously, Oblivion because it is a very, very dear, important game to my lineage with gaming, your lineage with gaming, Mike. Um, but before we kind of kick into button mash, what have you been playing this week? Um, well, I mean, I just got back from because I'll be honest, uh, I've been playing like one thing pretty much. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I've I've been driving a lot this week. So, 
before I left, I guess I would have been playing some, played a little bit of CS, but I mean, I didn't really play that much this week, just a little bit of Halo, but nothing crazy because I was traveling, like I said. Yeah, which obviously is understandable, but um, yeah, it really, usually I'm the one who, you know, you have your stable of games and I'm the one who usually kind of plays, you know, spends a little bit of time in a lot of things, but literally the past week I've just been playing Destiny. I don't know why I've fallen into this hole with Destiny that it's all I want to play. I've been trying to power level my Warlock that I'm playing right now, um, and I'm having a blast. Like, I'm finally finding that that really, really good hook that all of long-term Destiny players talk about, that no matter what's going on with the game, whether they agree with it or not, they found the hook that keeps coming them, coming back, like, keeps them coming back, whether it's, you know, doing campaign missions and and then or focusing on strikes or focusing on dungeons or hey i'm more of a pvp person i want to go into the crucible or like me i love 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 gambit where i like competitive co-op and then also there is a pvp pvp focus in there that Mm -hmm. there's a lot of rules that you can feel fill but um you know it's been great just going through and actually like powering up a character and whatnot i think my light level is like 1260 now and i think soft cap i think is 1250 and then hard cap is 1300 i think or 1350 i can't remember but it's something like that um so and i'm going through the uh you know the newest season two as well you know going through their version of a season pass and just going through trying to get through all of that stuff and get caught up on the content i have yet to buy beyond light i have shadow keep and uh forsaken so i need to go back and I need to go and get Beyond Light, but I'm trying to catch up on the campaigns. Uh, I finished Forsaken this past week, which is really good. Um, And then I'm starting Shadowkeep when I have some time in between. But outside of that, you know, just kind of that's been my main focus. Uh, My fiance and I started playing uh, Diablo 3 Couch Co-op the other day, which I was like kind of hankering. I sent it to our group chat that I was like thinking of Diablo, specifically Diablo 2, obviously. But um I wanted a Diablo experience and I was like, well, I do have it on console, you know, so send it over to, or I told Molly the one night I was just like, you want to play Diablo? She was like, I've never played before. I'm like, perfect. That's totally fine. <laughs> like, just let me go through it. You can follow me. <laughs> um, but I, uh, outside of that, that's, it's mostly been destiny. So quiet week on our home front. Hopefully that'll pick up, you know, later this weekend and into next weekend. And I'll have some more to talk about. Mike will have some more to talk about, but Let's get into Button Mash, Mike. If you're new to the show, Button Mash is where we run through our quick hit stuff for the week, our quick hit news stories before we head into our big topics for this week. So let's kick off Button Mash, starting with Diablo 2. Resurrected specifically is set to be released later in 2021, but players who can't wait to jump in to the remake of the classic Blizzard title will get a chance to participate in both a single player alpha and a multi- multiplayer stress test before then, which they talked about having an alpha beforehand, but they didn't specify whether it was single player or multiplayer. I digress. Spe- speaking to PC Games N, Diablo 2 Resurrected lead producer Chris Lena explained how the rollouts of all of these alphas will all lead up to the game's release. Quote, we're going to start with a single player technical alpha, and then we're going to have a second technical alpha after that, which is kind of a multiple- multiplayer and stress testing, Lena said, while also confirming that they will obviously have obviously arrive before launch. Dead by Daylight, a game that you and I like, Mike, a lot, announced its newest character today exclusively on IGN titled All Kill. The new chapter is set in the backdrop of a cutthroat K-pop industry. Jesus Christ. I have a feeling this killer is going to piss us off a lot. (laughs) Both the new killer and survivor will be ready to play in the public test build later today, uh, which is this article is from today. So it's right now if you're listening live. to the show it is live go ahead and jump in and get it <laughs> i'll fuck kill it. We'll do it live <laughs> fuck it we'll do it live <laughs> i'll kill introduces the newest killer the trickster a k-pop star with a per chan- or a pension for murder joining him survivor yun chin a music producer at a fictional uh mighty one record label in keeping with the character's K-pop themes, developer Behavior Interactive teamed up with Kevin Wu from the K-pop band You Kiss and DJ Swivel, a Grammy Award-winning uh, Canadian music producer who has worked with groups like BTS. Both will help make sure the K-pop industry and community are accurately portrayed. 
Hidden Path Entertainment, the studio that worked with Valve to develop Counter-Strike Global Offensive, is working on a, quote, triple A third person open world fantasy RPG that will take place inside the Dungeons and Dragons franchise. Hidden Path, uh, Hidden Path shared the news on Twitter by calling out for potential graphic pro graphics programmers, lead graphics programmers, senior technical artists, and writers to apply to join the team and work on the project. By looking at the job descriptions, it appears as though the Dungeons & Dragons project will be built in Unreal Engine 4. Hidden Path is also looking for those experienced in console technology, hinting at a release beyond PC, a writer who has narrative branching skills and experience with ensemble cast and more. Hogwarts Legacy, the upcoming game set in the world of Harry Potter, will allow for transgender characters. Uh, as reported by Bloomberg, sources have confirmed that players will also will be able to create a character that has either a masculine or feminine voice, no matter what their body looks like. Furthermore, they will be able to choose to be either a witch or wizard, no matter what or previous no matter what previous choices they made. This will then help determine what wizard, no matter uh, oh sorry, I'm doing the wrong thing. This will help determine what dorm they are placed in and how they are addressed by other characters in the game. Aliens Fireteam, a Left 4 Dead, well, they already got me there, a Left 4 Dead-like three-player co-op PvE shooter has been announced for release this summer on PC, PS5, Series X, Slash S, PS4, and Xbox One. Developer Cold Orange Studios revealed that the project, which was teased back in 2018, will take place over a multi-mission story campaign, seemingly similar to the structure to Left 4 Dead or Back 4 Blood. Cold Iron co-founder Craig Zavenchik said one of the goals of Aliens Fireteam is to fulfill the Cameron-esque fantasy we saw on the screen in the 1986 classic Aliens. Fireteam is set in 2020, er, 2202, 23 years after the original Alien movie trilogy. At this point in the timeline, Xenomorphs outbreak are rare, but the aliens are widely known about. The Colonial Protection Act of 2187 commissioned warships to patrol the universe and protect colonists from xenomorph outbreaks. You play a new soldier aboard the USS Endeavor and you end up orbiting uh, Katang after a distress call. EA has shifted Criterion Games off of its current Need for Speed project to help EA dice with development on the next Battlefield game. This game, which is currently untitled, is expected to release this fall on the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X, and it seems DICE needed some extra help getting the game ready for that release, according to a new report from Polygon. EA insists that Criterion will return to develop its Need for Speed title in 2022, though. Guilty Gear Strive has been delayed until ju uh, June 19th, pushing it two months further back from its previous April 9th date. Arc System Works made the announcement Wednesday evening, uh, citing feedback that the fighting game's recent open beta test. Arc System Works says that they will use the extra two months to focus on improving online lobbies and server stability. And finally, a series of Call of Duty Warzone voice lines have leaked, suggesting that the game will introduce new modes called Plague and Sandbox, which might include some racing activities alongside the previously announced Exfiltration mode. As spotted by PC Gamer, Zesty Cod Leaks posted the news on Twitter with a link to a video containing all the leaked lines. They point towards a trio of new modes which could be introduced in the future, although no dates have been suggested for when they might arrive. Quote, we, can, we can't, uh, quote, we can't lose Verdansk. Find those damn zombies, reads one of the lines related uh, to a moot plagued game mode. The narrator talks about how Verdansk, quote, Verdansk is lost and overrun and there are multiple mentions of plague zombies. The player, uh, the player should avoid. Exfiltration canceled, nuke inbound for Verdansk, barks the narrator, likely that the mission has ended or failed. The suggestion is that the players will have to try and reclaim Verdansk from a zombie horde and then exfiltrate. If they fail, the map will be loot. So, Mike, after all of that, running through button mash, before we get into our big topics of news for this week, anything you want to run back? Um... I guess Diablo 2 Resurrected, being able to play it a little early is going to be nice. Hope they get chosen to do that and actually mm -hmm. get to do that. And also... <coughs> cough, cough, looking at you, Turtle Rock, when we try to play <laughs> Back for Blood, but I digress. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just take it away. Next, we'll go to the big topics. <laughs> <laughs> God, that stung. 
That's fine. there's no way to there's no way to follow that one up. Yes, yeah. it's the truest shit I've ever heard. I, I you know I, like you know like the song um whenever uh, uh the nat rapper's names uh but you'll know exactly what I'm talking about whenever he starts off the song with this will be the realest shit I ever I never wrote. Yeah, it's by Jeezy. Yes, Jeezy. yes, Young yes. Jeezy. Whenever he starts off the song with this will be the realest shit I ever wrote. Yeah, that's like the realest button mash we ever did. And I mean, and I'm saying this in. We really, really, really would like to review the game, if that's possible. <laughs> we say that out of love. Um, no, the one thing I do want to just say once again, though, um, I really have a feeling that this new killer in Dead by Daylight is going to jam up myself and you, probably. <laughs> yeah, it's like, because they're releasing a new killer, I can't play the game for like two months until they figure it out. Right, exactly. So, and then people no... just go back to the old one tricks, like the uh like the pig from oh. dawn whatever so it's like Hands... i just can't even play the game <laughs> right well that's the thing yeah the uh, playing playing against jigsaw like the you know pig face dude from saw like is probably the most frustrating like that made me quit the game for a while i was just like i can't i i can't play against this killer this is just stupid like i'm i'm just not having fun at this point so i i totally agree with that <laughs> All right, Mike, let's head into our big topics for this week. And we don't have a, like I said, kind of a light news week, um, except for like one or two things. There are two big topics that I felt really to touch on this week were probably good. Uh, and two, one game that is already huge and making success, but one game that is much, 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 much bigger, I feel safe saying, at least in the zeitgeist of the, you know, actual quote-unquote hardcore gaming community and all we've seen is a fucking cg tra cg trailer for it until now and i'm talking about elden ring obviously but yes elden ring there's a lot of rumors a lot of leaks a lot of shit coming out about this game after it being pretty much dead silent since it was revealed in at e3 2019 at microsoft's uh microsoft's uh e3 briefing that year last one they did yeah yeah, last one they technically did at quote unquote E3. So, but yeah, Elden Ring, tons of new stuff coming out of it. And we got a whole write up here by Joe Scrabbles over on IGN, who did a really good job kind of piecing it all together and breaking it down into a couple different parts uh, that I felt kind of set the discussion table or the table for the discussion that I want to have about it um, and just kind of, you know, eases us into it pretty perfectly. So, uh, as always, link in the description, go over there, give Joe and all of uh, IGN's writers, everyone's writers who we cover in here, make sure you go over there, give them the clicks, the views. I know that stuff always really, really, really is important for the metrics that they have there. So anyways, let's jump into it. Over the past weekend, multiple rumors regarding a potential Elden Ring reveal, as well as internal delays to the game, have begun to pick up, pick up steam. Several publications and industry insiders have reported on the potential of an Elden Ring reveal of some kind, whether as a part of an event or a first new trailer since 2019, but it's become an increasingly tangled web in the past few days. With that in mind, here's a rundown of the newest Elden Ring rumors, which Elden Ring Elden Ring Rumors, it's kind of a tongue twister, which we'll update as we learn more. As always, take below with a grain of salt, and we'll confirm anything that comes to mind. So, first up, Elden Ring and the Microsoft Showcase Rumors. So, as of right now, nothing's been confirmed, but a lot of people are, you know, a lot of, I shouldn't say, let me specify, a lot of, you know, prominent people within the game's media and whatnot um, have been saying, hey, you know, they're hearing, you know, not confirmed, but like they're very much tongue in cheek saying, hey, from what we hear, Microsoft is planning to have an event of some caliber, whether that is a quick marketing, you know, digital event, you know, a quick one, not necessarily an inside Xbox that is more their magazine show that's like, you know, an hour or so long. Um, but they're going to have some kind of digital marketing event around the time of the Bethesda acquisition when that finally goes through, which is this month. So one would imagine it towards the end of this month. And since as far as we know, Microsoft has the marketing rights to Elden Ring, not, you know, exclusivity rights, but they showed up at, you know, their E3 briefing. Usually that indicates, hey, they have the marketing rights for that. Just like, you know, when Arkham Knight came out, uh, Sony had the marketing rights for them. When for the longest time, you know, Destiny, uh, just since it's fresh in my mind, 
had, you know, exclusive marketing rights with Sony to, you know, put out content on there and things like that, but mostly marketing things. Um, most recently that I think of is Jedi Fallen Order. Microsoft had the exclusive rights, uh, marketing rights for that. So you saw a lot of, hey, here's a, you know, bundle with Jedi Fallen Order, that type of thing. So rumors with that going around saying, oh, you know, there's kind of a lot of kick up of, uh, hey, we keep hearing that supposedly Elden Ring is going to be having, you know, it's going to be re-revealed, quote unquote. It's going to be shown people are saying like Jason Schreier and I believe Jason was more like I don't I haven't heard anything specifically but I've been hearing things that that could you know from people that it sounds like that could be the case so you know think what you want about that type of thing um but a lot of people are you know within the industry were saying like hey it sounds like this game is going to be shown again relatively soon so people are piecing that together so but Joe writes up over on his write-up on IGN, All of this arguably began as fans linked two separate sets of rumors together. On February 26, Microsoft reported Paul Thorat tweeted to say that he believed an Xbox event would be held on March 23rd. On the same day, journalist Jeff Grubb said on the Games Beat Decides podcast that he believed new Elden Ring information would be released by the end of March. On February 28th, uh, investigative journalist Jason Schreier added that there was, quote, strong evidence floating around that the game will be shown relatively soon. Fans and websites put the two sets of information together, uh, speculating that Microsoft event would include an Elden Ring trailer. Microsoft GM of marketing Aaron Greenberg subsequently said that that, quote, is not happening. So, kind of hard to tell a little bit. Um, you know, so just kind of like, I, I feel like the best place to go with this conversation is kind of going piece by piece with each of these sections. So, you know, with the Microsoft showcase rumors, Mike, you know, we've already seen that there's obviously this rumored event coming around um, with the Bethesda acquisition, though, you know, I'd like to stress again, nothing's been officially announced, but it does with from what a lot of I'm hearing a lot of what other people are hearing. It leads me to feel very confident that there probably is going to be something, um, you know, so but as for now, nothing's been officially announced. And even though Aaron Greenberg said an Elden Ring trailer, you know, or an Elden Ring reveal or something wasn't happening, it wouldn't be there. He said that before about specific events, including most most, most recently the Game Awards saying, hey, you know, nothing's going to really be there. Nothing major is going to be there. And then they reveal Perfect Dark, one of their mm -hmm. biggest, you know, releases to come out outside of probably Halo Infinite as of right now. So do you think Aaron is just, you know, he's being upfront, saying like, hey, you know, being honest, like, hey, just a heads up, temper expectations. You know, we, you know, hey, we may have something in the works, but don't expect something like this to be there yada yada you know is he being on do you think he's being honest with the fans or do you think he's just trying to keep as much momentum possible for this announcement and even this event that they don't have they want to control the message obviously with it so do you think this is something that you know both sides both bandai even with you know Elden ring and xbox just want to keep this under wraps and are willing to just you know take it on the chin i think it's kind of a win-win like if he tries to keep it on the low low mm -hmm. Um, and they kind of leak some information about it or they actually do a little bit of a presentation. It's good because it'll kind of be like sometimes those shadow drops can have a little bit of momentum building behind it. You know, mm -hmm. people aren't really expecting all that much. And they see it and they're like, wow, this is awesome. And you kind of let your work and your um, product kind of speak for itself. And I think that can be very beneficial in the gaming industry. Mm -hmm. But at the same token, also, if he's just being honest and nothing is released or nothing is shown then i mean everyone can be like you know wait why wasn't that shown and he can just lean back on this and be like i told you it wasn't gonna be so i don't get it so i think it's like it's it's actually kind of like a win-win for him to be honest to just like if he's lying like it's it's still gonna be a win because it's still gonna be pretty pretty crazy uh -huh. and if he's being honest like you know it's fine because he was being honest the entire time uh i do think like honestly deep down if if there is an Xbox showcase on the 23rd of March, that's going to be pretty soon. So I think that I think that we could see I, I I think he's probably being honest here and I think he's he's being legitimate because if there is going to be an Xbox showcase and the game was going to be there, I think he would just say, "Hey, you know, check us out or 
I don't know, because then again, then I was just about to finish what I was saying. Then it dawns on me that maybe Microsoft's trying to keep it under wraps to like not temper expectations, but like they want it to be kind of like more of a surprise. They don't want to leak in this manner. I, he's a, he's stuck between a rock and a hard place, and I'll say that I think he's being honest. I don't think the game's going to be shown, mm-hmm. whether or not there's going to be an Xbox showcase. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, and that's. I, but I could see him lying because Xbox wants to announce it and wants it to be a big deal, mm-hmm. and doesn't want it to like leak this way because then it's just going to be like, oh, Xbox is going to be having a showcase. Like, amazing. That's awesome. But it was leaked in this manner. It's just kind of odd, you know. Right, and and I'm totally on the same kind of mindset as you where i could see it going either way i kind of lean more towards i i feel like i feel like we wouldn't see i feel like one microsoft is probably wanting to if this is their event that's coming up i'm sure they're wanting to their biggest focus for how long now or at least the you know what they're wanting fans to think about is it's this is the best place for games and the one thing that they've been lacking is you know console exclusives and things like that so you know reasons you know actual software reasons to buy into this ecosystem that they can't get anywhere else and Elden Ring is going to be you know from software games they're not exclusive outside of uh you know Bloodborne on PlayStation but that seems to be a one and done type of thing for right now that you know traditionally these are you know third party games that you know are going to be available on you know PlayStation, Xbox and PC. So to me though with this event, you know rumored event being centered, you know centered around hey the acquisition of Bethesda and whatnot, I I have a feeling it's going to focus more on hey we're we're more focused on our first party titles. The these titles that you can't get anywhere else, you know, who knows it may lead to, you know, a tongue-in-cheek type answer of, hey, you know, Bethesda games are now exclusive. Not that I'm saying they're not going to come out and say that at that event, Mm -hmm. but it may allude to that, that, you know, these games, uh, day one on Xbox Game Pass, uh, the only way to play it, day one on Xbox Game Pass, or something like that, you know. It's messaging like that where they can wait, and I'm sure they're going to do a showcase around E3 you know, E3's time frame, which, you know, now from what we're hearing, we haven't officially heard anything yet that, you know, E3's trying to do something from what it sounds like online because they're not doing anything in person. So it's like, you know, how's that going to play out and whatnot? Um, you know, but it sounds like they're at least going to be doing something in the form of a, you know, digital event like they did pre- uh, last year with the Microsoft Game Showcase. So, you know, to me, that seems to be more of a logical fit for something like an Elden Ring comparatively, but who knows? I, I mean, anything could happen, but I fully, I fully think that if we see this rumored event this month from Microsoft, it's going to be focused on, I think primarily Bethesda titles. I, I think like, even though he, Aaron, I think more of the, the thing people need to focus on with Aaron saying, Oh, well, it, not, no world premieres or anything like that. I think this is what if you ask me, if we're seeing anything from Bethesda, we're seeing Starfield like Mm -hmm. we're seeing something like of Starfield, any kind of new footage for Starfield. Like that's the next game up in Bethesda's pipeline from Bethesda proper. Like I I, that's what more likely to me than Elden Ring being there. But with all this coming out, that kind of leads me into our next thing. You know, there's this reported Elden Ring trailer leak. So I kind of going back to Joe's article here. Uh, today, which was written, I think, Monday. So this is kind of a wrap-up of everything. VGC reported that an Elden Ring trailer has leaked online, apparently showing off-screen footage of gameplay from the much-anticipated From Software open-world RPG. The trailer is reportedly being shared in, quote, online chat groups, which means, in boomer talk, I guess, not that I'm saying, (laughs) not that I'm saying Joe's saying that, but just what people are referring to, probably, who don't understand the internet, Reddit and, you know, Twitter, (laughs) stuff like that, 4chan, you know, things like that. Um, Jason Schreier added that this is, uh, that this purported uh, trailer was the evidence he had mentioned previously. VGC adds that the trailer, quote, shows a montage of familiar Souls-style melee combat, boss battles against a fire-breathing dragon and a large sword-wielding foe, and a glimpse at horseback combat in a large open environment. So since that report, multiple images uh, purporting to be 
from that trailer have been posted on Reddit, but have since been proven to be fake. An image of a warrior in ornate, uh, ornate armor gained traction online, but has since been proven to come from ArtStation's account of artist Ben uh, Ben Rubold. Hopefully, I said that right. Seven seconds of what purports to be the game in motion, showing reveal, uh, showing several elements, including in VGC's reporting, have now begun circulating online. So, you know, kind of twisting on that, you know. What, Mike, if if you have seen this footage or whatnot, you know, what what's your thoughts on it in general? I know you really the only Souls game I know you've kind of dabbled in a little bit or wanted to even was uh, Sekiro just because of mm-hmm. the Ninja Gaiden-esque feel of it. Um, and it's always seemed like a genre that I felt like you would be totally in on just for the fact of, you know, you hear of its difficulty and this and that and you loving the you know, overtly difficult nature of Ninja Gaiden, but in a way that is, you know, it's designed to be fair and you know exactly why, you know, it's purposely hard, but in a way that is fair where Mm -hmm. you have to learn from the thing, like you could do it. You just have to actually buckle down and like learn, you know, different patterns and things like that, where Souls games are very similar to that. Um, You know, so what about this so far, you know, that we're seeing from this game kind of stands out to you that makes you interested in or, you know, uninterested, but, you know, wouldn't make somebody interested in a Souls-like game experience like this that's trying to move that genre forward and expand it to, you know, there seems to be more, as somebody who's played, you know, through a couple different Souls games, you know, much more traversal and, you know, exploration devices like horseback riding and things like that, Mm -hmm. you know, what do you think that says about this genre moving forward? And, you know, what does, you know, this entry, I guess, do you think that it's going to really do for the genre? Yeah, I think it's it's be- definitely pushing the, like, broadening the horizon of this genre. It's one that a lot of people have mixed feelings on. Some people love it. Some people hate it. Um, I think one of the things that I, that, you know, causes me to gravitate towards this genre more so than, you know, other other people might be pulled to towards it is like I think that the difficulty of these games provides this rewarding feeling when you succeed that is very hard to get elsewhere. Um it's something like, you know, something achieving a goal in life almost sometimes, depending on like a smaller goal because some bigger goals are much bigger than games. But like, oh man, like I really would like to solve this Rubik's cube within 30 seconds, like that type of thing comes to mind. And then you also have, you know, these games beating this boss that you've been stuck on for a month. Like it can be really rewarding to people and it, it teaches people to persevere. And to me, that's the biggest appeal to me, but kind of pushing the genre forward and adding new, um, you know, mechanics and things of that nature to the game is great because it's going to potentially cause a lot more people to, be interested in the game and get involved in it and it's also going to cause you know new folds like it's not just going to make oh man like this battle is really annoying and and frustrating or this boss is really cheesy how am i ever going to beat him but then there's going to be parts where you have to use horseback riding and you're gonna have to go through like some type of maze or some type of you know difficult terrain and you're gonna have to use certain abilities to get through it and that's another way to be difficult without just straight having some boss curb stomp you for two hours straight or something you know what i mean like Uh it's just going to be nice that they're going to mix it up and i think it's going to add a new layer to this genre that you know it's just been not that this genre has been lacking as a whole because it gives people what they're what they want out of it but i think it's going to you know add a different flavor for those people that you know do really enjoy the souls boring games no definitely and and i've i've seen the footage i've watched it you know obviously who knows it could be all doctored i i don't believe so and it seems like you know people with reputable track records like jason schreier you know hey this is what i saw or in line with what i've seen you know so or heard or whatnot you know so and from what i hear actually too the footage that was shown was actually from like a build from like two years ago or something like that so supposedly from what i'm hearing what officially is going to be shown is going to be look a little bit better even on top of that so a little more polished and whatnot but as somebody who has 
you know, I, I get to finish a Souls game, but I end up playing them like, you know, I think I'm like 30 plus hours into Dark Souls, um, you know, so and you know Sekiro putting in 20 or so hours and I usually end up falling off them because of you know some of the reasons like you're saying like you get stuck on one boss and it's just like I don't want to bang my head against a wall for this long but Mm -hmm. um you know it's at the same time though there are a lot of things about those games that I find enjoyment that want me to keep coming back I mean 30 even though 30 hours isn't a ton of time to put in game 30 hours is 30 hours of your life that you're dedicating to that you know so to me that it's like you know, seeing what they're doing with this game and it feeling like it has much more, and I, I'm sure I'll get flack for saying this, but like personality compared to other Dark Souls games where, or I should say Soulsborne games, where they're much more focused on, it sounds like it's going to be much more cinematic to a degree, um, where previously dark souls games were much more you had to if you wanted to know the lore of dark souls you had to do some digging if you wanted to Mm -hmm. know the lore of bloodborne it was like you learned you learned the narrative of bloodborne and through like item descriptions and stuff like that me personally i don't like that i I, I, you know i'm playing the game i want to like learn about it which i'm totally cool with i like the you know, little things that you find in games, Easter egg things that reward players for going through and reading those item descriptions and things like that. That's different. But like me, I fall more in line with something like this, where it's like, oh, I want to be pushed, you know, for more story beats and things like that. But, you know, who knows? That's also from, you know, whatever, a minute and a half of footage that we've seen, not even probably um of this game off camera type of thing so it could could have changed it could have been evolved or whatever but i really think that this is you know it's getting positioned as a title right now that i think can really bring in much more people especially to having george rr martin you know somebody who is already so well known for creating a universe that is you know at least from the book series and you know you know, three fourths of the show beloved, um, you know, a universe that is really liked and somebody who is great at crafting characters and, you know, a living, breathing world that people want to get lost in. You know, I'm 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 excited about it personally, but um, it seems like it's it's trending, at least if I'm looking at it, to evolving the souls born and getting that's to a degree of. You know, a lot of people say, oh, the barrier to entry is so hard because I can't change the difficulty in a Soulsborne game. And it's like, I get that. I can't pause in a Soulsborne game, except for Mm -hmm. Sekiro. I think you can pause that now. I think they did that in that one. But you can't pause them. You can't do, you know, things like that. You can't change the difficulty where it sounds like this you're going to be able to do. And even if you can't, they're making more, more ways to coax people into saying, hey, Yes, it's difficult, but you've played games like X, Y, and Z, and we're doing things like in those games of X, Y, and Z. You just, you know, it it is more difficult, but you'll learn to play it. If you like those, you're going to like this type of thing. So, but I digress. So next on the list, Bandai Namco next trademark. So Twitter using Twitter user Nibel, who everyone who really loves gaming should follow him and Wario64. They're like the tandem of like, if you're into video games and you're on Twitter, those are like two people you should for sure follow because they keep you up to date with everything. But pointed, he pointed out that a Bandai Namco trademark registered in 2020 for a product called Bandai Namco Next. Some have speculated that Next could be branding for a Bandai Namco specific game showcase similar to a Nintendo Direct at which an Elden Ring trailer could be shown. The trademark was published in January of 2021 and Bandai Namco has not commented on what Next could be at that time. And kind of like bundling into that because i think we could talk about these both at the same time as they're kind of the smaller ends of this story uh as part of its reporting on the trailer vgc said that sources close to an Elden, uh, close to Elden ring had told the publication that the game had been delayed several times because of pandemic related production difficulties those delays were speculated 
by one source to have pushed the game's release out of 2021. Elden Ring has been notably quiet since its reveal in 2019, although head of Xbox Phil Spencer says he has, quote, played quite a bit of the game, and concept art created for the trailer did recently emerge. Developer from Software has previously thanked fans for their support after the game's subreddit took, uh, took telling the game's story into their own hands. So, you know, what, Mike, I know we kind of talked about, like, you know, how you know do we expect this at xbox's thing you know does it does it make more sense we've seen a lot especially this past year with the pandemic and whatnot no e3 where you know at least publishers and you know independent game developers and whatnot can take their their projects to an e3 by show floor by you know a booth at a show floor to get in there and show their game now are being able they kind of changed that a bit to have a lot of these kind of mini showcases online um that we've seen similar to nintendo directs over the past summer with you know jeff Keighley's summer of games fest and whatnot um you know so does this make more sense for showing a product like this you know say say it doesn't show up on you know xbox's showcase that they're potentially doing in march you know say bandai you know wants to get this out there sooner than e3 does something like this centered around elden ring make sense i would say yes like i I would say that you know trademarking something right before what we're guessing could be like a March Xbox (laughs) showcase or something of that sort. It definitely makes sense. And I see like the reasoning behind it. And I think it would be Elden Ring because like, what else are they, what else is really coming down the pipe for them? You know, that's, this is kind of it. You know, the thing Uh that we've been hearing about the most, I don't think they'd have something else on the slow cooker and like be distracting us with this game and then pop out something else. You know what I mean? Uh No, definitely. Definitely. And, kind of in tandem with that it would make sense to with if they're going to at least in my eyes you know talk about the project that if it was you know internally delayed multiple times and whatnot like it makes sense to i think control the message a little bit more compared to bringing it to an xbox stage um you know or or you know sony stage or whoever you know bringing it to a you know one of the e3 showcases for the three hardware manufacturers i you know i think that makes more sense to obviously control the message a little bit more we've seen that with bethesda and whatnot um you know with how they kind of handle their games that whether they're developed or produced by bethesda or published by bethesda but you know if my thing has always been now too if we're looking at this from more of a macroscopic perspective where you know game development now with the transparency that's kind of come into games and more people being you know involved with games and being able to talk to you know their favorite development studio or whatever by just opening up an app on their phone and going to you know at halo and it takes you to 343 directly like you know and tweeting at them you know do you think in this post-pandemic world a delay like this having it internally delayed and things like that due to with how you know feverish and that the fandom of soulsborne games and from software game fans are you know is this type of delay really kind of like a blessing in disguise to a degree where you know, yes, COVID helps it out for, you know, a degree of, you know, hey, yes, obviously we're running into issues with COVID, but this does give us the leeway that our fans are going to understand, like, hey, it's a pandemic right now. And it seems like more and more people are coming around to the idea of that, you know, overused quote by, you know, Shigeru Miyamoto that, you know, a rush game could be bad but the late game will eventually be good or whatever you know more people are coming around to that idea of how games are developed and whatnot that it seems like this could potentially be a good thing in the long run or the current situation could help them get to the point of their game of what they want out of this game for both them mm-hmm. and the fans so what do you think yeah i think that they're in a really good spot for the room for the delays because everyone just witnessed cyberpunk 2077 fall Mm -hmm. flat on its face and 
they're probably counting their lucky stars. Not that anyone would ever want a game to like bomb the way that that did, but they're probably loving the fact that like this high profile, very high budget game just, you know, released with all these issues, but like, you know, even though it had all this money and everything, it still, you know, kind of fell flat. So obviously, you know, people are going to now potentially become a little bit more lenient when it comes to delays and things for good reason. Like when you just see a game that was cared about and spent so much money on like cyberpunk 2077 and it falls flat, you know, when you hear that your next game that you want to play Elden ring is going to be delayed. You're like, well, fuck, I hope it's not going to be like cyberpunk 2077. Oh, they're delaying it. Oh good. They're not making the same mistake that like, we have to get this game out as fast as possible because we need to make the money, you know? Mm -hmm. No, definitely. And that's where I definitely see this as kind of like the glass half full type of Mm -hmm. approach where everyone is still in the same boat whenever it comes to, and especially, you know, I remember Jason Schreier bringing this up last year that him saying like, you know, when the pandemic was first going on that people need to understand that this is going to affect the timeline of games and of game releases, really anything past mid April is expect potential delays, like if not anticipate them, you know, so it, it it's it, it, it kind of having that mindset now, I think has transformed a lot of people over the past year of like, oh, shit, OK, that kind of, you know, this just falls in line type of thing. But also, too, it's it's taught patience, I think, to a lot of people with games. Um, you know, more people are gaming even more than ever right now. And there's so many other there's so many projects out that people have just missed that I think are people are still like, OK, cool. You know, especially, you know, somebody like me who is, you know, quote unquote, hardcore gamer like you, Mike, you know, people who play games have played games for 20 plus years almost daily that it's like you know if not daily that yeah i guess i'm getting old now i've been probably playing video games for 24 years right maybe longer, like almost daily yeah right like <laughs> a quarter of a century we've been playing games now at this point where it's like you know we have backlogs we have stuff we have games that we replay and stuff and people are now just finally i think starting to get into that like from a mainstream standpoint that i feel like people are just starting to become more and more accepting on so many levels where it's like almost like a kickback like type motion where, you know, people are just getting into games and finding, finding all of these games now because they've been stuck at home and whatnot. But also too, you know, the people who have been in the hardcore audience have been playing more of the games that they have right now because they're saying, Oh, I have all this backlog. I've been buying games. Oh, I only got to put a couple hours in this game. I'm going to come back to that, you know, where there's, they're realizing more that, you know, more games are getting more time spent in them, I guess is what I'm trying to say that from our standpoint that, you know, that is the wheelhouse of from software's audience, the hardcore, you know, quote unquote, hardcore audience. They're not really pandering to a lot of quote unquote casual gamers because of the difficulty and, you know, somewhat of a barrier to entry in general. So, you know, they know that's probably going to be their primary demographic. So the people who are really in the know when it comes to gaming that, they're the ones who are going to understand this. So to me, this just seems like it's kind of the perfect storm for them in the way that the pandemic in a weird way has helped them out with some of their development struggles. And obviously the pandemic plays into that a little bit of putting them in that situation. But in general, I think that's going to have a bleed over effect as we kind of start to come out of the pandemic eventually here at hopefully knock on wood some point this year. So, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of good things that are coming out of this game. Uh, so far in terms of you know what we've been seeing i think it's going to reach a lot more people um than previous from software games i mean i'm definitely already cool to get in on it like i'm 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 ready to give it a try type of thing um just from a lot of the various aspects that they seem like even just quality of life things compared to a lot of different souls games that i've tried and some clicked some didn't so um this seems to be much more up my wheelhouse and a much more like I said, the barrier to entry becomes lower with these games, which I, me personally, I, I never think that's a bad thing. Um, you know, and I, I know that kind of gets into, you know, the artistic vision or, you know, creator's intent of how the game was supposed to be made. And I'd never want to get in the way of that. But if it, 
helps more people play the game and get into the game, I don't think that's a bad thing. And I think that is okay to add that where it could be, you know, Hey, we've seen it how many times in how many games we play, Mm -hmm. even, you know, where it's like this, you'll have options of, Oh, you can play this way or you can play this way. And the developer will even know this is the way the game there. This was the the way the game was meant to be played. This is how we designed the game around this, but we want to give you the option to play like this too, because we want you to have the experience you want to have type of thing. So, it is what it is, but I, I'm really excited for this game, surprisingly. Um, the more I get closer, the more I see of it, but Mike, let's head into our final news article for this week, and this is another game that I was talking about earlier that is very much so still a big deal, um, and sometimes I have to remind myself, because obviously the the talk of it has kind of died down a little bit, but it still does really good numbers on Twitch. It's really still one of the you know, with it being at one point, you know, free for PlayStation Plus members at one point, you know, it's a game that has remained very much so in the zeitgeist of gaming, and that's Fall Guys, specifically their developer, which has now been bought, or in the process of being bought, by Epic Games. So this comes from Nick Stat over on The Verge, as always, the link in the description. Fortnite creator Epic Games is acquiring video game studio Mediatonic, the maker of smash hit Fall Guys, for an undisclosed sum the company has announced on Tuesday. The deal marks one of Epic's higher profile acquisitions of late, following its 29 purchase, purchase of social video app House Party and Rocket League developer Psyonic. Ho- uh, according to the blog post and fact detailing the announcement, Fall Guys will remain on available on Steam for the time being, and the developer is still bringing the game to both the Xbox and Nintendo Switch platforms. Epic and Mediatonic say there are no plans right now to make the game, which currently costs $19.99 free to play, as Epic did with Rocket League. Epic later confirmed its plans to make the PC version of Fall Guys available on the Epic Game Store. Interestingly, Fall Guys is built using the Unity game engine, a rival to Epic's Unreal platform. Despite that, the company says that they hope to bring Fortnite-style features like crossplay to Fall Guys in the future. The acquisition includes Mediatonic and Fortnite or er, Fortitude Games, both of which are owned by parent company Tonic Games Group, which announced the deal with Epic today. Quote, it's no secret that Epic is invested in building the Metaverse and Tonic Games shared uh, shares this goal. As Epic works to build the vir- uh, this virtual future, we need great creative talent who know how to build powerful games, uh, content, and experiences, said Epic CEO Tim Sweeney in a statement. At Tonic Games Group, we often say that, quote, everyone deserves a game that feels like it was made for them. With Epic, we feel like this. Uh, we feel like we have found a home that was made for us. They share our mission to build and support games that have a positive impact, empower others, and stand the test of time. And we could not be more excited to be joining forces with the team," said Dave Bailey, CEO and co-founder of Tonic Games Group, in a statement. So it feels like, to me at least, you know, Epic Games is just this like Thanos of gaming right now, going around scooping up and now owning a lot of these studios who are responsible for some of the most like content creator friendly titles, you know, obviously most recently, like they mentioned psionics with rocket league, um, you know, so outside of, you know, financial security, Mike, what does this deal offer both positively and potentially negatively, you know, if we want to think that way to Mediatonic and fall guys. And I think this is a dumb question at this point, but you know, is moving to a free to play model now just, pretty much inevitable for fall guys unfortunately because i bought it yes Um, (laughs) same (laughs) the best thing about epic really starting to push is the one thing that i feel like valve understand like the only thing that valve understands in the gaming world is competition and i feel like with valorant getting bigger and bigger and hopefully Mm -hmm. better and better because i think it's obviously very good for the ecosystem of esports to have a game that riot you know makes like this the popularity all that even though it's a bunch of washed up north american cs go pros i digress i don't want to go i don't want to go on on that too long because it's only a matter of time before all those old heads are crushed out of valorant too but mm-hmm. i love that valorant's getting popular i love that epic is doing the things that they are doing because ultimately it's going to make valve it has to put valve on attention like valve is going to have to really think like oh wow epic's starting to compete with with steam and 
Valorant's starting to compete with CSGO and whatever are we going to do? And then they're going to release fucking Source 2, finally, after all these years. The new CS game's going to come out and blow everything fucking else out of the water, like usual. They're going to make a new portal, like usual. They're going to make a new Half-Life, like normal, and blow everyone else out of the water, and then go back to dormancy for the, another 15 years. Like, mm -hmm. it's just what I see happening coming down the road for Valve. And for me, being like a huge Valve Steam fanboy, this is awesome because that's what they need to get their ass in gear. And I'm just pumped that, you know, Mediatonic and Fall Guys is going to go to a free-to-play model because I feel like a lot more people are going to be playing it. The player base is going to go up. Even though we did see cheaters when we played, which was like, <laughs> I don't fucking get that. But yeah. people will <laughs> cheat at anything, obviously. But I'm just so excited because I think competition is really good for everyone involved. And this is going to be great for Valve and for the games in general, because anytime there's something to compete with someone else, it's going to make the person that has been complacent, which in this in this case is obviously Valve, you know, step their game up finally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's I, I definitely think that could potentially be the case. Um, you know, to me, this seems like. It just seems like a no brainer that this game is going to go free to play. Like, it, it, there's no doubt in my mind that we're going to see within the next, you know, not might not be down the road or might not be like next week or anything, but within the next year that Fall Guys goes free to play because it that model just works so well with so many live service s games anymore that I think more people are willing to invest in them. I mean, and that's what got me into investing in Destiny where you know you try a little bit before you buy almost type of thing and then you you're more willing to get in there and invest in it because you have to feel if you know the loop is good for you and whatnot and fall guys is just so it's just so universally friendly to so many different sex with sect sect if i can talk within gaming that I feel like it opens the door for so many people that it's that perfect game that you could just pass the controller around to anybody. We talk about that with like Fortnite and things like that. And I think that's why that fits so well with Epic's model in general, because they provide experiences like this Ep or with, uh, you know, Fortnite Rocket League. Rocket League is a super simple game. Yes, it's it's easy to understand, hard to master, but it's also easy to pick up and play and understand what you have to do. And it's a good time that you can just give people a controller and they can easily figure out what to do without very little help. It, it almost has that Mario Kart effect where, you know, it's easy to just pass around to a bunch of people. But, you know, I agree that this could in turn kind of like that fire, like you're saying, you know, mm -hmm. with a valve, with somebody like that, um, you know, in those certain ways. But I, I see this as at least for Mediatonic, I see this as a no loss situation where realistically, I think for the most part from what it sounds like Epic for, you know, external studios that they have now acquired and become internal seem to be very, I don't want to say hands off, but mostly Hey, here's the keys to the car. You go and drive it type of thing mm -hmm. um, where they provide them. They know they're worth coming into it and they have the money that cool. If it doesn't pan out, no sweat because they do. They have they're getting to the point where they have beyond fuck you money. And it, it, it's it's to that point where it's like, OK, I get it. I get, you know, the reasons why, you know, why you see. Oh, yeah, we'll take we're going to take less off the top from creators uh developers who use unreal engine now uh at least from the unreal engine store or you know hey epic games the epic game store is going to take less money from you because we have fortnite and that makes a ton of money for us that makes a stupid amount of money for us that we can afford to do that and you know if it means more acquisitions like this which means now giving studios like mediatonic more money to one more, most importantly have financial security that they know that no matter what they're going to be getting a paycheck at the end of the week. They don't have to worry about, you know, a check not clearing type of thing situation. Um, so outside of that, I mean, I really don't see there's there's not like a pro league with, you know, fall guys or anything like that. There's not a competitive scene where something like this, I feel like really, really, really fits well into that model that Epic is trying to offer right now to a lot of people that. Mm -hmm realistically i see no downside to this for the most part because 
Fall Guys now is is going to be cemented for a long time, or as long as Epic wants them to go, which Epic will probably let them go as long as possible. But hell, they still, I'm pretty sure they still support the Unreal Tournament, like, reboot that they tried how many years ago now. They're still supporting that game, so... Trust me. I think, I, th- they, I think they discontinued it because I got a, an alert when I got on recently uh-huh. and it said like, I don't think it's being, uh, it's okay. not being anymore, unfortunately, because I wanted to, I wanted that game to work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Unreal Tournament was dope. I loved Unreal Tournament. I, I didn't play the reboot, but in mm-hmm. general, Unreal Tournament is fucking sick. Um, but point being that they still support that game for quite a while and they're open to doing that. And they have the financial, they have the capital to be able to be like, yeah, sure. Whatever. Like, oh, okay. If you're struggling a couple months, that's okay. It's cool. We'll, we'll figure it out. We'll make it work. So, you know, it, I think this is more of a no lose situation for both sides for the most part. Um, and it keeps fall guys relevant for a lot longer than I think some people were expecting it to be. Um, so all good stuff in my eyes, but Mike, Send a party chat before we wrap up the show this week. If you're new to the show, obviously, party. Ch- oh, I should say. If you're new to the show, party chat is where we propose one question at the end of each week that we want to discuss before we wrap it up. Could it be as simple as what's your favorite story beat in the game or what have you been focused on during quarantine and gaming? Or it could be a little more in depth as to like, you know, why the negative stigma of gaming still exists. And after answering it ourselves, we'll kick it over to you to tweet your responses to the question over on our Twitter at gpgc podcast and we'll read some of the responses the following week last week's question who do you think would win in a fight master chief or doom guy and freaked 819 said doom guy he just keeps coming back for some reason fair (laughs) i'll give you that fair okay (laughs) he's not wrong (laughs) i can't i cannot argue with that logic yeah sound (laughs) no it is (laughs) Mike, so this week's question, do you ever see xCloud becoming more popular than traditional console gaming in the Xbox ecosystem? Now, this isn't necessarily this generation, next generation, whatever. Do you ever see that form of gaming, really just cloud gaming in general, overtaking in terms of, you know, market share? Really, I guess, if you want to talk about user base, whatever, uh, within the Xbox ecosystem, now that they offer that at such a affordable level, I guess, or accessible level. If you're talking about something like this, which could be on an infinite timeline, I think there's a lot more time to go. There, okay, so the reason why I'm going to pick that xCloud would be more popular than traditional console gaming mm-hmm. is because the timeline for console gaming, mm-hmm. we know how long that's been. And while we don't know where the end is, we know that xCloud is in the infancy. Internet speeds are getting better. Technology is getting better. I would go with the xCloud becoming more popular just because there's a lot more time for xCloud to evolve and get better. And I think console gaming is like, we know it's been around for, you know, 20 so tw- twenty or 30 years, but xCloud could be around for 50 or 60 easily, you know, with technology getting better and better. Mm-hmm. No, and I don't disagree. I was going to say, really, if you think about it, like just alone from the in like and and i'm talking about x cloud on a broad range of hey we're talking the desktop pc version of that or the browser version of this on your pc like mm-hmm. i'm including all of that but if we want to just look at mobile alone and look at you look at the mobile phone market as it is like even that alone is impressive enough to be like Okay, yeah, yeah, I could see that even if they get like a tenth of that, that they're going to be blowing fucking console, the console portion of it out of the water, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, so it's it's eventually transferring those people and getting those people into the ecosystem is going to be the hard part. But that's going to be the interesting part. I, I think I think long term, like you're saying, like more so infinitely, I think there's more of an upside to this, or at least I think there is potential for this to run and X cloud to run more than console gaming, because I think console gaming is going to see at some point it's end, or at least in the version that we're seeing it as right now. Um, and eventually it will just be PCs for the most part, I think. Um, but till we get to that point, obviously I, I, you know, within the next five years, I still think console gaming is going to be primarily the next thing. But when we get to the next console generation, who the fuck knows you know Mm -hmm. what what's it look like are we moving towards 6g at that point like you know what's that look like so for now i definitely i i definitely think long term we're going to see 
potentially that be the case where we could see cloud gaming take over traditional gaming. And in this case, X cloud with, you know, the Xbox ecosystem, but Mike, I think that's going to do it for our episode this week. Why don't you tell people where they can find you on the interwebs to talk about all the dope and nerdy shit we talked about today. You can find me on Twitter, on Twitter at T O I S X L D I E R. That's toy soldier. And the second O is an X. Or you can find me on Twitch at MP underscore Toy Soldier. Nice, nice. And as always, I'm your host, Travis White, a.k.a. Travis on most internet platforms, including at Travis underscore on Twitter. That's right. It's T-R-A-V-L-E-S-S underscore on Twitter. You could also find me streaming time to time on Twitch.tv slash Travis underscore, same as Twitter. And if you want to play some video games with me, you can do so over on Xbox Live at just regular old Travelus. That's T R A V L E S S. And this, ladies and gentlemen, has been your newest episode of the Game Pass Game Cast, your weekly go to podcast for all things Xbox, Xbox Game Pass, and PC gaming, including news, rumors, and conversations around them damn good video games. You can catch new episodes of the show when they drop each and every Friday morning on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and all other major podcast services. So be sure to subscribe to us, rate us, review us, all that jazz wherever you get a podcast at, and follow us on Twitter at GPGC Podcast. Stay up to date with everything regarding the show, video games like and our dope giveaways. With that being said, Mike, that's going to do it for our episode this week. Thank you, everyone, so much for listening, sharing, and being a part of our growing community. Game on. Wash your hands. Listen to the doctors. Black Lives Matter. And we will see you next week.